This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. So happy to have all of you join us. And as you may know, we are working our way through another mighty tome, uh, Murray Rothbard's Opus, Man, Economy, and State. For those of you who have been around the last uh, three to six months, we've been going through a lot of really seminal works in the Austrian t- tradition and finally made it all the way through human action in a series of podcasts. Uh, took a one-week hiatus, and now we've embarked on Man, Economy, and State, which has already been fun. We're using the uh, second edition published by the Mises Institute, which contains also the Power and Market chapters, which were originally intended by Rothbard to be in the full book. And we sort of started out a couple weeks ago by giving people a little taste of the book and trying to argue why a lay reader should tackle this 1,200-odd page uh, exercise. And we had our great friend Patrick Newman for that. Last week, we did a show. I did a solo show, actually, on the very first chapter of the book and trying to draw parallels between that book and part one of Human Action, which we read most recently, which is considered sort of the philosophical part of the book, which English majors like myself like, and economists not so much. But now we're getting actually into the meat of the book. We're going to work our way through chapters two, three, and four, which are sort of uh, Rothbard's treatment of exchange and prices with also some money thrown in. So it's really some nuts and bolts uh, parts of the book. And really, if you just read Uh, What amounts to a little less than 300 pages, we're talking about page 79 to 317 in the uh, second scholar's edition of the book, you will know a heck of a lot more about money and prices and exchange and utility and barter than, uh, I hate to say it, most people out there walking around. And uh, we've got a a great friend in studio this week as our guest. It's Jonathan Newman. Many of you may know his name as a frequent writer for Mises.org, a professor of business and finance at Bryan College, which is not too, too far from us in Tennessee, and also a former summer fellow a couple of different times here at the Mises Institute and a PhD economist, economics graduate from Auburn University right across the street. So all that said, Jonathan, great to see you in person. Hello, yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And Jonathan is also one of our instructors at Mises University next week, which is our annual summer program for undergraduate students which at the moment anyway is going uh, going ahead physically on our campus here without masks, and we're excited about that. But Jonathan, I'm going to mention something to you, I guess, to start here that I uh, mentioned last week in the show, which is just when you start digging into Man, Economy, and State, this is, this is an instructional book. This is text. This isn't flowery uh, literature like human action. Yeah, you're right. It's, uh, it's very logical and step-by-step. Um, and just to, to go back to something that you said in uh, your previous show, you talked about how economics is is splintered. You talked about how there are all of these different specializations within economics. So it's really refreshing to see Rothbard take something and build it from the ground up. So he starts from just nothing and he lays the foundation and he, he builds up this entire edifice of economics. And I think maybe the first chapter it could be likened to like a foundation for a house. And then in these chapters that we're discussing today, it's sort of like framing it out. It's it's sort of building the structure of, of the house that's on top of the foundation. And you you don't see that in economists uh, these days. They're discussing, you know, health economics and labor economics and development economics and behavioral economics. And, and you know, it goes on and on. Uh, and so it's just, it's really refreshing uh, to see Rothbard building something from from scratch like this. Do you think if a PhD wrote a, or attempted to write a treatise like this today, they'd get some grief for it? Yeah, yeah probably so, especially if they're a fresh PhD, uh, just because, you know, th- this this is something that uh, only a mind like Rothbard or a mind like Mises can produce like a massive treatise like this. So it, uh, even though Rothbard wrote this at a pretty young age, uh, I wouldn't expect this of, you know, your typical uh, graduate out of, out of school. <laughs> So chapter two is just called direct exchange. I guess we might uh, call that barter. Uh, it intru- you know, introduces a bunch of concepts that Rothbard wants us to know, like value, use value, exchange value, comparative advantage, price, specialization, division of labor, supply and demand, equilibrium. Um, so I guess first and foremost, what, you know, what's, what's chapter two all about? What should a lay reader get out of it? Well, he, he starts off the chapter... Um, distinguishing between voluntary uh, interpersonal action and interaction 
and violence or involuntary uh, interaction. And so he makes this he makes this distinction and he says that what we're developing in man economy and state is all of the voluntary stuff. So what can we say about the way people interact with each other on a voluntary or contractual basis as opposed to if somebody wants to you know take something from from you and they just you know bonk you on the head or th that's what Hans Hoppe said uh, in one lecture uh, hit you on the head and, and take what you have so we he, so Rothbard is contrasting that sort of arrangement with peaceful cooperation and voluntary interaction and that's where we see market prices emerging where we see suppliers and demanders interacting and coming up with market prices which he develops in in chapters uh, two three and four and the the picture that he paints is actually, it's a really uh, beautiful one of, you know, a contractual society where we're all um, sort of interested in each other and what each other wants, what what our fellow man wants, because we had to produce what somebody else wants so that we can benefit. Um, and so we see this society being painted where, you know, it's peaceful and cooperative as opposed to, you know, the opposite. Yeah, it's interesting. He starts with violence and 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 calls calls certain actions hegemonic. That's very Rothbardian. That's not what you'd get in in your average text, uh, your average econ one hundred and one textbook in the first chapter. Yeah, in the in the first chapter of your average econ textbook, you you would see like these big ten ideas where they you know say incentives matter and mm -hmm. and then they'll they'll even touch on some macro relationships like the phillips curve or something like that but you never you don't start with you know bare bones you definitely don't start with let's contrast you know voluntary interaction with slavery and see see why these are different that sort of thing so he's talking about violence you and i would apply that term to state action but do you think rothbard means here that violence lies outside of sort of praxeological analysis well, to, to an extent it does, uh, but we can we can still say that people are acting with a purpose when they're committing an act of violence. So they're still, you know, using means. And in fact, Rothbard mentions this in, in this chapter. He mentions that uh, for a slave owner, they're treating this other human being as a factor of production. And so you could still sort of, you know, parse through the means and ends, but, you know, it's it's in a constrained sort of limited way. You definitely can't develop, you know, this this massive edifice of economic theory based on hegemonic relations. Well, you mentioned that um, he brings up social cooperation here. And of course, that was a big, uh, conceptually, that was a big thing for Mises. He even considered calling human action social cooperation, titling the book that. And I, when I'm, as I'm reading that, there's the idea of which comes first. You know, do people want to cooperate so they create markets or do markets create cooperation? And my sense in reading through that, of course, is that a lot of our friends on the left would say that this is fantasy land thinking. Yeah, some authors say that the there's this desire for us to be together in community, and that's what produces civilization. That's what produces you know people coming together and and you know what we see today, which is you know cities and businesses where people are working working together. Uh, Rothbard and Mises uh, say that it's the opposite. Is that first we have this incentive. First we have this. Uh, this material benefit that we can earn by producing together, by specializing in one job, another person specializes in another job, and then we trade the the output of our of our production, and then that leads to you know more permanent, lasting social relations between people. So it's the it's the uh, it's it's the other way around for for Rothbard and Mises. First we have this material in incentive, and then we develop the social relations. You know the sort of the nice feelings that we have for for one another. But of course, you know, there are plenty of people on the left and plenty of libertarians, in fact, who argue you have to eat, you have to have shelter, you have to have clothing. So these things, when you're out there in the marketplace, hopefully trading services for them or, or you know, trading uh, your, your efforts for money, um, that these things aren't so voluntary because you have to have them. So in effect, the, all this social cooperation that Rothbard and Mises are talking about takes place under some kind of duress. Yeah, I'm... It, that doesn't really make sense to me. It, seem, it seems to me that it's it's more plausible that people will engage in, in social cooperation. They'll trade with each other because there is this mutual benefit, and that's really that's really where Rothbard starts. He says that at the very you know smallest thing that we can look at in the economy, which is one individual trade, uh, there's mutual benefit for both parties, and so both parties expect a benefit as, as a result, and so they'll engage in this trade with one another. And then it's just a matter of expanding that you know. Uh, to a larger and larger scale to where we see, you know, the big economy-wide things that Rothbard discusses later. So I don't, I don't really see um, 
the a basis for you know saying that all interaction between people has you know a little tinge of duress or something like that. It seems to me that it's it's simpler to say there's there are interactions between people that are it's just clearly mutually beneficial, and we shouldn't you know try to prevent that as much as the state would like to. Well, you mentioned that this conceptual land that. Rothbard lays out here is beautiful. That sounds like an economist. Cause I, I don't get a lot of beauty from this chapter r- reading it. So elaborate what you mean. Well, he, he's got this great quote uh, from the second section of chapter two. It's, he says, the distinguishing features of the contractual society of the unhampered market are self-responsibility, freedom from violence, full power to make one's own decisions, and benefits for all participating individuals. And so that's just like a, a beautiful picture. And it, it follows directly from what he's saying about exchange and, you know, one person producing and another person producing, and then they trade the result of their production. So there's, you know, responsibility for what you've done. There's uh, this, uh, it's not a guarantee, but there's at least this expectation that there won't be violence. And it I, it seems to me it paints a, a pretty picture of what society could look like. Uh, he takes a lot of pains to provide precise definitions in this chapter, which helps set the stage for the use of those terms later in the book. Again, is this something that you don't generally see in e-context books? You you know, we're talking about really uh, what seems like simplistic definitions of things like price. You you do see definitions given in mainstream economic textbooks, but there's not a lot of uh, emphasis on making sure that we've excluded all other possibilities when we're making that definition. So like the goal of a gef- of a definition is to be able to rule out all the things that aren't the thing that you're trying to define. And you it, things get sort of fuzzy in, in mainstream textbooks, but things are, are not fuzzy at all in, in Rothbard and Man, Economy, and State because he, he – takes great pains to make sure that he's clearly defining what he's what he's trying to analyze. And that way, that makes the analysis itself much clearer. Well, I'm struck towards the end of this chapter, there's two little sections, 12 and 13, which really stood out to me. Um, starting with 12, he's talking about property. And by this, he means real property, land, and the appropriation of it and how we develop original ownership of land. And, you know... In reading through that section, which is actually pretty short, I'm reminded of the point that there's really nothing is unnatural in the material world. Everything we've got, even the most toxic chemical that we create at some plant somewhere or some bizarre uh, non-biodegradable plastic that's floating around in the ocean somewhere. I mean, everything's natural to Rothbard. Yeah. So, and it's actually interesting that ties back to uh, the economics of the structure of production where um, everything can, all, all payments, all expenditures by producers go back to the original factors of production, they go back to, to land and labor. So it all goes back to what, what we start off with. What do we start off with, which is given to us by earth. And so, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So Rothbard says that whatever, whatever we have here on this earth is, you know, sort of our starting point, And this is what we build our entire economy on. And part 13 is this discussion into property rights themselves and gets into a couple of areas that is kind of – that are kind of Walter Blocky and he gets into airwaves and water and, you know, he talks about the property status of airwaves, for example. And it actually – I just want to throw this out there to you. You're, you're too young, but I'm old enough to have been a Randian when I was uh, in my teens and 20s a little bit. And she actually wrote an essay called The Property Status of Airwaves – which I loved. It's included in her uh, her collected series called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. It's in that book, along with that Alan, great Alan Greenspan article on gold, by the way. Uh, but in that article, which, you know, whenever I read it as a young guy, was, was I thought was phenomenal. She says, look, airwaves are, are, are limited. They're finite. Uh, but so are diamonds. So are, you know, the amount of uh, the number of acres on earth, everything's finite. That's not an argument for having the state control it and having to pay the state for a license to use it. And so uh, rereading this section the other night, I went back and looked up her article. I realized, I think she wrote it in about 64 for the Objectivist newsletter. So actually she doesn't mention Rothbard. Uh, I'm not going to say that she borrowed from him or that she didn't. But, um, you know, j- just the idea of uh, talking about property rights in this way, really, it, I-, I won't say it's a departure from the rest of the chapter, but it struck me as, as this is, you know, the kind of thing, again, you wouldn't expect to see in a text. 
Yeah, as, as, since we're contrasting it with uh, mainstream textbooks, yeah, you're you're right. This is not something that this sort of discussion is not something that you would see in a mainstream, uh, you know, college textbook on economics. But you're right; it's also not a departure for Rothbard because it's an essential piece of the, in, of the puzzle that he's putting together. You need property rights as a prerequisite for trade to happen. So, in order for you know one person to trade with another person, they have to have you know ownership of the things that they're trading. And so, it's just, it's a you know, just another important piece of the puzzle that, that Rothbard is, is laying out here. Um, it, it's not a departure at all. And if you're interested in defamation and the Rothbardian blockian argument against defamation, uh, in that part 13 of chapter two, you'll find really an excellent couple of paragraphs on why you don't own your reputation because that consists of other people's feelings and thoughts and opinions about you. And, and it really lays out the case. Uh, you, you can decide for yourself whether you agree against defamation. So, Jonathan, I want to—I don't want to spend too much time on chapter two because chapter uh, three and four we really get into a, a, a meatier discussion of, especially money. So, chapter three is is the pattern of indirect exchange. Of course, indirect exchange requires to, to have something to trade that we don't necessarily want, and that emerged as money. So, we really get a, a discussion of Menger here, right? The emergence of money. Yeah, he he talks about where uh, money originated, and he's relying uh, definitely on on Menger's initial discussion of that. Um, and he he takes care to uh, you know refute the the circular fallacy. Or people were saying that the regression theorem is just a circular logic that you're saying that the the purchasing power of money determines the, the value of money today, and vice, and it just keeps on going around and around. And Rothbard shows that no, we're going. There's a time element, so the purchasing power of money today is based on people's anticipation of being able to purchase things in the future. And people's ant anticipations of being able to purchase things in the future is based on, you know, what we were able to spend our money on today and yesterday. So it goes back in time. Um, and there's also not the, he also, you know, gets rid of the uh, infinite regress uh, criticism that sometimes shows up. It's not infinite because we can go back to the first time that gold or some other commodity was used as money. So, what struck me about his treatment here is that it makes hyperinflation sound so scary. And there's historical examples we can go back and read, and some of them are more recent than others, about hyperinflation. And when we're talking about the purchasing power of money, um, we get used to it having a certain amount of purchasing power, at least that power eroding slowly. And the idea that it could erode quickly would throw all of our good intentions and planning out the window. Yeah, it, it is a scary uh, sort of situation. There's a great article by uh, Dr. Salerno on the sort of the psychological impact of living in a hyperinflation environment. I can't remember the title of it right now, uh, but he, he talks through some, some of the things that were going through people's minds. What were they writing about? Uh, what were they doing in the, the hyperinflation in uh, Germany? And it, it was, you know, scary stuff. You know, people had made plans. People had... Uh, they had set aside these resources so that they could, you know, live happy lives. And all of a sudden it's just gone. It just, it just goes away. There's, if your money doesn't have any purchasing power, then all of, all of your saving goes away. And it, it just makes it extremely difficult to make plans even from that point on, because, you know, prices continue to erode and the ability to make plans just, just goes to nothing. You know, the over 65 population in America is set to double over the next few decades. And you reach a point in life where you're probably making less money, you know. And, and when you think about that, when you think about purchasing power and people's plans for their future, um, you know, I was reminded of a conversation I had with Professor Per Beeland in reading Chapter 3 where we went back and, and Per had made the point that when, when Mises talked about calculating using money prices, you got to assign money prices to things to, to calculate mathematically or with a, a balance sheet, a ledger. And, and uh, Rothbard talks about that here as well, that that actually had a profound impact on civilization itself. That this is, this, you know, monetary calculation is not just something for economists and accountants to think about. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So that if, if we get rid of the ability to, to calculate net worth or to calculate profitability, if we give it to the entrepreneur's ability to, to try to figure out, should I pay this much for this factor of production, then you, you totally erode the capital structure entirely. You totally erode, you know, the social relations that we were just talking about that Rothbard discussed in, in uh, chapter two. So, so money 
Rothbard mentions this in chapter three, money helps us solve this economic calculation problem. So without uh, a commonly accepted medium of exchange, businesses can't compare costs and revenues. So their costs would be like this, you know, strange arrangement of goods that they'd have to pay the owners of, of factors that they receive. And their revenues would also be this, you know, strange arrangement, the stockpile of goods that they would get from selling their output. And if you can't make that comparison, then you can't, you can't know if your business is doing well. You can't, you can't decide on whether you should purchase, you know, this factor of production, where you sh whether you should hire this worker. And so, if business, if the ability to con conduct business breaks down, then, you know, society itself, you know, is going to struggle. And aside from calculation, money also gives us the opportunity to have higher order goods. In other words, to not just uh, buy and sell things that we sort of immediately need for consumption or immediately want to trade away for something else, but actually to put money in the bank and have a um, higher order goods, which are, of course, uh, intimately linked to civilization itself. Yeah. So uh, Rothbard mentions that. He says that if we have money, that allows the division of labor to, to expand even more to an extent where we have people specializing in specific stages of production. You mentioned the higher order goods. So if, if we have, you know, just direct exchange between people, then there's no opportunity for production to exist in, in multiple stages or for production to, to be elongated to any serious extent. Um, but with, with money where you can pay, uh, somebody at the, in an earlier stage of production, some money so that they can get the things that they want, then it makes it possible for, for one person to specialize in, you know, getting raw resources out of the ground and another person to specialize in chopping trees down, another person to specialize in farming the specific thing that they farm. So money, money allows the division of labor to expand to a, to an enormous extent. It, it'd be extremely difficult to, to overstate the importance of this expansion in the, in the division of labor and its impact on our material well-being well today. Well, the other thing that struck me in chapter three here is Rothbard takes some pains to talk about cash balances, money balances, and what they are and why people have them. And it reminds me that there's a, a famous article by Hutt called The Yield for Money Held. And uh, Hoppe wrote a little bit about this and why there actually is utility, so to speak, from holding money and why people do and why they should, and that the desire to hold money increases with uncertainty. So, of course, uh, with the, the crash of 2020, which is still unfolding before our eyes, you know, we find that people have a lot more cash or trying to hold more cash in their balance sheets and that maybe uh, airlines and some other industries should have held more uh, cash in their balance sheets. So um, money has functions that maybe we don't think about day to day. Yeah. So in in the sort of the end of chapter three, I have this quote where uh, Rothbard says, every man must allocate his money resources in three and only three ways in consumption spending, in investment expenditure, and in addition to his cash balance. So everybody is making choices as to whether they want to consume, whether they want to produce, and any money not used in those two is held in, in their cash balance. Uh, but that the cash balance isn't necessarily just a remainder because as you said, people will want to hold on to cash for specific reasons. So they anticipate a certain level of uncertainty in the future. They anticipate either prices increasing or decreasing, and that's going to influence how much money they have in their, in their, in their cash balance that they don't use for those alternative uses, which are consumption and production. Sure. And of course, um, Dave Ramsey always starts with this in his personal finance discussions, have six months cash saved up. I mean, there's a psychic benefit to, to having cash, the most liquid form of cash money in the bank. Yeah. So chapter four, prices and consumption. This is, this is really a great chapter. I really enjoyed rereading this. Uh, it gets a little bit into, again, Mises' regression theorem. But this idea, which I think is still a little murky for some people, maybe it's still a little murky for me, is you know, money prices as exchange ratios. What's what's an exchange ratio? Well, in barter, it's pretty easy. You, you can figure out how many chickens you'll take for a bushel of wheat or something. You got problems with that, though, if you don't want what the other person has. But exchange ratios, you whenever you go out and purchase a good or service, at least in the United States, you're, you're receiving the good or service and you're paying a dollar. 
or, or X dollars for it. So we tend to spend a lot of time looking at the quality of the good or service you're buying. You know, you hear about a roofer in your town and you look up some reviews or you want to buy a new car, you check out that car, well, you know, tons of reviews. But then does the seller of the car, Honda, how much time do they spend thinking about the quality of the dollars they're receiving? I mean, we have to assume that smart economists and lawyers at big corporations on some level, maybe subconsciously sort of factor in uh, what the Fed and what Congress are doing uh, when they set a price for, let's say, a Honda Accord. Yeah, it goes back to what we said about the the regression theorem. So the purchasing power of money today is based on people's anticipations of being able to to use it in the future. So when people are ex- are receiving money in exchange today, they've got to they've got to at least be thinking about what that money is going to do for them in the in the near future. Uh, so if they're if they're you know expecting lots and lots of inflation, that means they might you know want to uh, charge higher prices today for things. So I guess those those sorts of uh, anticipations that people have about monetary policy, uh, what the supply of money and prices are going to be in the future, uh, I, I would say that those expectations are are already priced into to what people are paying today. Do you think they do that competently? Uh, I, I don't know. Only only time will tell. I, I guess. I mean, I I don't think too many business people think a lot about the Fed. Yeah, it's uh, the Fed sort of hides behind this, you know, this complexity, this sophistication. So they they make their announcements and they they use you know the big words and the sophisticated methods in their announcements uh, and so they sort of hide behind this you know this air of sophistication and it makes it difficult for you know your average you know small business person to to you know make sense of what the fed is doing and what does it what does it mean for their bottom line when when the fed is you know increasing the supply of money you know astronomically well you mentioned that uh, people make exchanges because they feel better off as a result, um, whether that's psychic or monetary, you know, it doesn't really matter. That's, that's the reason they make exchanges, not because they're exactly the same off. Um, by definition, they feel like they're better off, you know, giving up the money in exchange for the good. So um, Rothbard takes pains to make the distinction again between ordinal and cardinal preferences. This is, you know, very important feature of Austrian economics, the idea that we can't apply some sort of objective criteria to, to your subjective uh, preferences. But what struck me, Jonathan Arrhenius, was the, the idea that the parties feel better off. And it just contrasts so strongly with the political tone of our day, where everything is zero sum. Everything's about vanquishing the other side. Everything's about, you know, we're going to make those Trump people pay in the fall when Biden's president. You know, it's just, it's, it's, the, it's sort of the anti-advertising you know, advertising says, hey, come buy this. You know, you'll, you'll feel better. You'll look better. Or you'll, you'll, you know, lose five pounds or something. You know what I mean? And, and politics is sort of the opposite. It, it, it feels like everything is, is uh, vote for our guy and we'll get them. Yeah. The one thing about money is that it, it does make, it, make many more exchanges possible. And Rothbard mentions that in the text. But the other thing is it attaches a number to every single trade, every single exchange. And so a lot of people, economists included, will get wrapped up in, in the numbers that they now have available to them. So they can look out in the world and people are paying certain prices and they can see certain people are earning you know, certain amounts of, of profits. And so they latch onto these numbers, which are you know, sort of easy to grasp and compare with each other. Rothbard takes great pains to say, no, we can't, we can't compare uh, utility. We can't compare you know, the subjective values between people. Um, money makes that that fallacy much more attractive. One other thing to your point uh, is that now that we have money and we can calculate our profits or people can you know figure out what people's profits are, then there's this extra uh, chance for people to to get envious of of how much other people are earning. Uh, so we see you know Bezos is you know raking in billions now, right and mm-hmm. and so people get very envious of that. Um, so mm-hmm. that it, if money has a drawback, maybe that's it. Where now we have uh, this, you know, basis of comparison between people. Where that person has much more money than I do, therefore, you know, I'm going to call myself a victim. But even let's take the former Soviet Union. Even when it was not easily or quickly measurable, like we talk about somebody's net worth, like Jeff Bezos has, you know, however many times more money than I do. 
you know, the, the average people in the former Soviet Union, they still knew when they looked at that party apparatchik that they had a better car or a better apartment or, or you know, better meals or whatever. I mean, it's not like this goes away under socialism. Yeah, that's true. So, so envy is here uh, no matter <laughs> whether we have money or not. So if, even without market prices and the ability to see how much, how much money people, people are making, uh, uh, that, that doesn't take away you know, this you know, propensity for us to be envious and covet what other people have. So. But if we're talking about economics largely as cooperation and trade and specialization using money, you know, scarcity, choice, all these things that Austrians stress. I mean, again, it strikes me that maybe those of us who are very strong libertarians or ANCAPs, maybe we're sort of using the wrong language. In other words, it's economics versus politics in, instead of no state versus the state. In, in other words, economics, the way we conceive it, t- takes place um, without compulsion, without force, without violence in a cooperative manner. And so a lot of what we get up and do every day in dealing with our fellow humans is a, a form of anarchy in that sense. You go into the restaurant and everyone's happy and they give you their food and you give them the money, right? That, whereas politics, there's always a loser. Someone's always mad. Someone's always trying to harm someone else. You know, there's nobody at the restaurant trying to harm you. Yeah. So a lot of what we experience on a day-to-day basis is, is what Rothbard mentions in chapter two, which is that gains from trade that we get. So every single exchange – which many of us do many times a day, uh, represents this mutually beneficial arrangement between two people. And just like what uh, Rothbard contrasted that with, which is the you know violent interactions between people, uh, we see that on a day-to-day basis through the actions of the state. Um, you know, I would just suggest to people who are interested in this topic of economics versus state action and entre- entrepreneurship – versus state action to really check out Hunter Hastings' podcast he does for the Mises Institute called E for B, Economics for Business, because guests like Hunter himself, but also Per Bylan and Mark Packard and others really talk about how um, entrepreneurship is the antidote to compulsion. And it's really a fascinating topic the more you think about it. And uh, speaking of compulsion, Jonathan, you know, in this in Rothbard's treatment of the diminishing marginal utility of money. And he obviously, he goes into how Mises was the first person to apply not not only marginal utility, but subjectivism to money. And that that was sort of Mises' big improvement over Menger in the theory of money and credit. Um, It struck me that there's a good reason why our progressive friends maybe don't so much mind high taxes, right? Because if you have... $10 $10 million, uh, a tax bill matters far less to you than if your net worth is 10000 or 20000 because you're spending a lot more of your, uh, your money on uh, food and essentials and, and rent and that sort of thing if your net worth is 10000 So So when people say like, look, you know, Warren Buffett says raise my taxes. Okay. But if you take away 90% of Warren Buffett's net worth, he is still a centimillionaire uber elite in society. You take away 90% of everybody else's net worth, and we're probably down at the food bank. Yeah, so the, the diminishing margin utility of money works in both directions. So, yeah, the, the additional dollar received is, is worth less. But like you said, it works the same in the other way. So if you take away somebody's you know, last dollar, that's going to be worth less than the, the, the remaining cash balance that they have. So – I. I had the opposite sort of interaction with a, a business person later. It's a, a local business person here in Auburn, who and he was he was just complaining about the level of taxes, and he prepays his taxes on a quarterly basis. But even at the end of the year, he still had to make this you know massive payment. Mm. So so yeah, you, we can find these examples like Warren Buffett saying tax me more. But if you poll or if you ask you know your average uh, business person, they they view it as a thorn in their side. They view it as something that's really inhibiting their ability to to create value. For, for consumers. So another bit of point of departure here um, by Rothbard is in his discussion of land, labor, and capital. Those are the three, three categories we often think of in traditional texts. And land, labor, and capital basically produce rent, wages, and profit. And Rothbard says, well, it's not, that's not necessarily the case. It's not so clear. And he has his own treatment of this. Yeah. So the typical way that this is presented is that you know, labor earns wages and capital earns rent. And, but Rothbard says that there's no way for us to, you know, specifically parse out, you know, what's receiving what. Um, and he says that in all productive factors 
earn a, a combination of these things. So capitalists will earn uh, interest uh, by parting with, the, by advancing the funds earlier on in the production process. And then there's productivity for labor. And so there's there's income for that. So Rothbard, Rothbard says that it doesn't really make sense to say that, you know, this one sort of thing earns this one sort of income. It's really more of a of a blend because all of these things are happening at the same time. What did you think of his section on planning in this chapter? He, you know, not surprisingly for Rothbard, attacks the idea that um, planning is going to produce uh, b- better outcomes to the, the, you know, the market pro- process of prices and consumption. So uh, did that feel like he was working his own normative concepts in there? Or did, did you think it flowed? I don't, I don't know. I think, I think it, it flowed. It, at least it makes sense to me. So we can compare how a central planner might make decisions and how an entrepreneur makes de- uh, makes decisions. And we can just see scientifically, there, you don't have to bring in any ethics to it. You can just see that an entrepreneur who's subject to the profit and loss mechanism of the market, who is engaging in economic calculation, trying to decide what what factors to combine and what ways to produce things that consumers want. And there's this check, there's this loss possibility that prevents them from, you know, making incorrect decisions. So that that sort of check, uh, at least to me, shows that there's there's this you know rigorous, you know, scientific backing for saying that we should we should prefer, or at least we can see the the material benefit to entrepreneurs who are voluntarily combining factors of production, as opposed as opposed to some you know bureaucratic you know central planner who's who's either using. Uh, bad rules or they're just trying to repeat what was done in in the economy before, not taking into account potential changes. Well, it seems to me the honest way for a mainstream text to approach this would be to say something like, yes, while taxes and regulations make an economy overall uh, less prosperous and do skew uh, individual incentives and behavior, many policymakers feel that they are justified uh, to to ensure that the uh, the you know that welfare and other uh, uh, inducements are available to the the poorest people in the society, right? I mean, you could you could sort of present this in a neutral way, in an honest way, but I don't think that's what what textbooks do. I don't think that's what they say. Well, textbooks, yeah, they'll they'll, they'll make you know excuses. They'll say that. Uh, we can impose this tax on this market, and yeah, you can see you can draw the deadweight loss triangle in the graph, and you mm-hmm. can see that there's this loss. But hey, there's this also this tax revenue rectangle, and the government can use that to to you know we can pay for roads and we can you know pay police officers to enforce laws and that sort of thing. So so they yeah they'll pay lip service to the you know the small deadweight loss triangle, but then they'll try to revive the tax revenue portion, which which they think in their minds that it's, you know, going towards something that's that more than offsets the the negative of the deadweight loss. And Rothbard would just have nothing of that. So he would say any extraction, that tax revenue, any extraction from the productive market economies, it's a, we can just, you know, chalk it up to waste. It's it's not something that's uh, subject to the profit and loss test of of the unhampered market economy. There's there's no there's no saving graces here. There's there's nothing that we can revive out of you know the tax the typical tax tax treatment. Yeah, and of course Mises would I- admit the loss, but also justify justify it on the grounds of whatever state's necessary. Yeah, I, I know that that's a, a a major point of difference between Mises and Rothbard. So Mises sort of saw that there were these cases where the government should should or could at least. Uh, be doing certain things in in a beneficial way. But even then, if you read Mises, he always has like this asterisk, not a literal asterisk, but he says that in order for this to actually work out, citizens have to pay really close attention to make sure that the mm-hmm. government's not wasting any money. So even I think even Mises saw that the money's being wasted. Perhaps he just didn't he he didn't have the benefit of, you know, Robert Murphy's books and Rothbard's treatment of, you know, what actually could the services that are typically offered by uh, government look like on a on, on the private market. There's an interesting little piece uh, towards the end of this chapter about some of the fallacies relating to utility. And I can recall from my own long time ago, undergraduate econ classes, you know, sort of these, these, these discussions of utiles and this and that. Um, so... It, it appears that Austrians have made some headway in uh, in sort of pushing the idea of cardinal utility out of the the, the corpus of neoclassical 
economics today. So am I uh, overly optimistic there or, or am I right? Uh, perhaps. So I had discussions with my uh, professors about this uh, and the typical response was, yeah, the utility isn't cardinal, but that's the only way that we can, you know, draw the graphs that we draw. That's the only way that we can, you know, apply the equations and then come up with the other results. So mm-hmm. it's it's like a yeah, but sort of response that, that I've gotten. But I, I love the uh, the discussion that Rothbard has at the end of this, uh, of chapter four about uh, burdens ass, the indifference problem. So it's just it's just brilliant and something that you don't see anywhere else. So there's this this old uh, paradox in in economics where there's an ass that's confronted with two uh, equidistant ha- bales of hay uh, or or oases of water, just depending on who's writing about it. Um, and the point is that the this donkey won't be able to prefer one over the other because they're exactly the same and they're the same distance apart from the from the donkey. So how how could the the donkey figure this out? And this is used as an example of of indifference for mainstream microeconomics uh, and consumer choice. And Rothbard just says, no, if the if the donkey doesn't make a choice, if 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 the donkey doesn't move towards either one of those, then that's the choice that it's made. It's decided to to starve to death. And it's like only an ass would be able to, to do that sort of thing, be stupid enough to do that. Uh, and he's he mentions that perhaps if somebody stuck in that sort of situation would use chance to figure out to go to A or B, to go to one. Or flip a coin. Yeah, yeah, to flip a coin. And and Rothbard's point is that by flipping a coin and going to A instead of B, you're demonstrating a preference for A over B. So in Rothbard's ultimate point is that it's not the physical characteristics or the physical distance of one good uh, to the person who who might consume it, that matters. What matters is how that good is subjectively perceived by the person. And so, if the outcome of a coin flip is what it takes for somebody to go to choose one thing over something else, they're demonstrating a preference. Still, mm-hmm. I actually got some feedback from last week's show. There's a little appendix uh, on pra- about praxeology at the end of chapter one in in, in man economy and state. And Rothbard goes through some of the who, what, when, where, why type questions. And somebody said, well, if we prefer things sooner in time, all of the things being equal, we prefer uh, whatever, we'd prefer to have our dream house at age 40 rather than at age 90 because of the uncertainty of life. He, he asked a question, what about, um, what about physical geographic proximity? All, all other things equal, do we prefer closer physically than farther? I, I just listened to a Tom Woods show um, episode where Robert Murphy was discussing this with uh, Tom Woods, uh, and he actually likened it to the law of time preference. And he actually says that we don't need the the universal law of time preference, that it, economics could make do without a law saying that we prefer given satisfaction sooner as opposed to later. But we can, we can still talk about the, that we do value sooner rather than later. We just don't need it for, for interest theories. And he actually brings up proximity. He says we don't need a, a law of proximity preference in the same way that we have a law of uh, time preference. So, And the example that he gave is, yeah, so if, I, if I'm considering two ham sandwiches, I would prefer the one that's closer as opposed to the one that's further away because I can enjoy, I can eat the one that's closer to me. Mm-hmm. But with a TV, for example, I don't want to, I don't want my nose up on the screen. I want it to be a certain distance away. So I, I thought that was an interesting discussion. And, and I, I'm not quite sure uh, what I make of uh, Murphy's argument, but it is interesting. Well, sometimes I have this sensation, like maybe you'll be looking at an item in Walmart. And oftentimes it is made in China, not always, but it, uh, you know, generally not made in the United States, an inexpensive item. And I'll look at it and it'll be so cheap. you know. And I'll think about, it had to come here on a ship from thousands and thousands of miles away and packed into a box with a bunch of other similar items and dispersed, distributed. So all the costs in getting that little knickknack to me in Auburn, Alabama from China. And I think, how is that possible that this thing is a dollar or whatever? How is that possible? Just the fuel and the logistics and all that. And and part of me, you know, I'm, a, I'm as much a free trader as anyone you'll find. But part of me sense that there's got to be government interference somewhere that makes this little knickknack easier to bring to me from 6,000 miles away on a cargo ship than from somewhere, you know, geographically closer. Do you know what I'm, yeah. you know what I'm referring to here? Yeah, yeah. It, it is sort of, uh, it's a spectacle if you think about it, how it's possible to provide, uh, you know, 
people in Auburn, Auburn, Alabama with, you know, this massive variety of goods that were produced all over the world and at very cheap prices. Uh, but speaking of proximity preference in, in Walmart, one, one thing that I have is I don't like to grab the, the item that's right on the front, you know, so the items are, are, you know, on a, on a hanger or something mm-hmm. on the shelf. I don't like to grab the one that's, you know, at the, at the very front because I feel like people have walked by and they've breathed on it or they've touched it or anything like that. And I guess I'm that much of a germaphobe where I'll go to the, to the second one or the third one behind. But Rothbard would say that in, in that case, I'm not valuing those goods offered for sale in the same way that those are actually two different goods because I'm subjectively, I'm thinking about the germs and the, how many people have touched that, the product that's at, at the very front. So I will reach. I'll go to the very back. <laughs> get that back. But what if the last person thought that? Too? Yeah, that's. I, I haven't thought about that. So I got to think about the way other people are are doing the same sort of thing. Well, I want to wrap the show up with a question I ask all of our guests. Obviously, you're not only a PhD economist, but also someone who's deeply, thoroughly read in the Austrian school. So in that sense, in two different senses, you are probably different than most of our lay audience listening today. But first of all. How did you come to know about and read Man, Economy, and State? That's question one. And number two is, is would you or could you make a case that a lay person uh, will actually benefit from p- giving up a lot of their free time to, to tackle this book? Well, I, I found Man, Economy, and State um, probably with my first visit to Mises University, which I think was 2009 was my first time coming. And I came to Mises University because – I looked up the Mises and, and the Mises Institute after I read Economics in One Lesson, which was recommended by Ron Paul in his book, The Revolution. So I'm, I'm a Ron Paul convert. Um, and so through that chain, Ron Paul to, to uh, Economics in One Lesson, to the Mises Institute, Mises University, and, and then I found Man, Economy, and State. Um, and my encouragement to, to somebody who was thinking about reading this is it's, it's just a real treat. For me, I teach economics. Um, and I teach economics to undergraduate students. And it's just a real treat to see Rothbard piece something together step by step, starting with, you know, very bare, the, like the just the, the bare minimum, which is, you know, starting with the action axiom. And then from that, he develops this entire edifice of, of economic theory in one, in one book. It's, it's just one, it's a one-stop shop really for the entirety of, of economic theory. And the analogy that I think of is like an amateur guitarist at a rock concert. So I, when I'm reading this as an economics teacher I, and I see him just, you know, clearly explaining these things and, and you know, starting at, at one level and then adding one more thing and then adding one more thing and adding one more thing until you get to, you know, a theory about the structure of production or about the benefits of the division of labor or also the the economic effects of of monetary expansion. So – so all of these things come from logic step by step, and it's just a it's a marvel. It's a real treat to see uh, Rothbard develop that. It, it, the fact that it's so clear, it's it's a it's a real encouragement to me as a as a teacher that such a thing can be done. We can you know clearly explain things in a step by step manner. So I mean, when I say, do you think lay people should read this book? the answer has to be yes. I mean, we're doing a podcast here, so you got, you got to say yes. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's something that anybody who, uh, I, th- there's a great quote by Rothbard saying that it's, it's no crime to be ignorant of, of economics, but if you're going to have any sort of opinion about it, then you, you need to know about it. Uh, this is where you should go. If you want to uh, have a, a more developed um, knowledge of what economics is and, and the effects of public policy, um, then Man, Economy, and State is it's your one-stop shop. It's its just an incredible treasure trove of, of knowledge. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I encourage you to pick up this book. Again, if you go to Mises.org, go to our store. You can find this book both in a beautiful hardcover for uh, $20 with our code, which is H-A-P-O-D, or for just, I think, $10 in paperback with little tiny print uh, using the code H-A-P-O-D. You can also just type Man, Economy, and State into your uh, search box there at Mises.org, and you can pull up a very beautiful searchable HTML version of that so you don't have to buy it if you don't care to. You can either just view it online or download it for free onto your machine um, and, and you know, read along with us because you're going to enjoy it a lot more if you tackle it in smaller increments and smaller doses and if you have some, uh, uh, some of our e- economist friends joining us to help you work your way through this, I think you'll get a lot more out of it. 
Uh, So we're about to dive into the next few chapters of this book, which are really uh, a place where Austrian shine, which is the whole concept of the structure of production, which is something in roundaboutness, which is something that is not uh, um, very well thought out in what we think of as mainstream economics today. So you want to stay tuned for that and read ahead if you can. Uh, I want to thank Jonathan Newman for his time today and hope that all of you have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.